Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word, the great book of Isaiah, which is to say, Yahweh's salvation. And it is from Him that salvation comes. Uh, this uh, book written to Jerusalem and Judah, you might say the barometer of times. In other words, you watch Jerusalem uh, as far as the end times are concerned, and you can pretty well uh, get what, where we sit, prophetically speaking, in the Word of God. Having said that, we're in this fifth chapter of uh, Isaiah, and this is the parable of the vineyard. And God started the chapter off by saying, hey, I, I picked the choicest spot, I picked the choicest plants, got the soil just exactly right, built a fence around it, and put a watchtower. And people just trashed it. He, and what, what came up from that? Poison berries, poison grapes, and what a disappointment to our Father. And He lets us know about it. So He follows that with six woes. And we're ready to have the last three in today's lecture. Chapter 5, verse 20. Let's go with it. And it reads, Woe unto them that call evil good, and good evil, that put darkness for light, and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. Just absolutely turn things upside down. And who is the prince of darkness? Satan is, of course. And many are going to put him for Christ because he's Antichrist. There's a special reason that he's called Antichrist, which is to say instead of Christ, because he's going to play the role. And many people are going to think that the bad is good and that the good is bad. That is to say God's election that stand against him. So our father, though, says woe to them. He'll get even, no problem. Verse 21, another woe. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. In other words, um, they know it all. You couldn't tell them anything. You know, nobody knows everything, and everybody's got to have an open, free mind before you can even learn or continue your education in whatever field or subject um, you might choose. You, you've always got to be open-minded to, if anything, even to learn new things that haven't been discovered yet. It's, it's exciting to let your mind uh, do uh, research on, on the unknown. And if you think you know it all, you slow down, you get sluggish, and nobody can really tell you anything. Our Father doesn't like that, because example, the word itself is pregnant. That means it grows. You can, we can study this book of Isaiah, and the next time we go through it, we'll be discovering new things. We always add those in, never mentioning it, but adding them in as we go. Verse 22. The last woe. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, and men of strength to mingle strong drink. Now, one more verse, and then I'll explain. Which justify the wicked for reward, and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. In other words, we've already had one woe about strong drink, but this is a little different. This means woe to those that... Um, that are mighty to drink, but men of strength. In other words, they draw their strength from the bottle. They get real brave when they get a few drinks under their belt. Those kind of people will get you in bad, bad trouble. Also, they'll get a few drinks under their belt and they'll promise you the world. And, and by the time they sober up, they're not going to remember what they said. So, and, and uh, as far as bravery to go to battle with, Somebody that really, they'll get very brave uh, on alcohol, but I'll tell you what, they'll let you down every time because it is a coward liquored up. That's, that's exactly what it amounts to, and he says, woe to those that do that. Bunch of wimps trying to use alcohol to, to, to be heroes. It won't fly. 
you either have it or you don't. And if you're one of God's elect, you're, when, when it's too deep for everybody else to plow, it's just right for you. But they, they'll justify the wicked for reward. They'll take bribes. You can bribe them, you betcha. And um, they will take away that that is righteous from the right. Why? By lies, con artist. That's the way a drunk is. They'll do it every time. Okay, so that completing the six woes, okay, and that one comes to destruction. That's why it's so severe. Verse 24, therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Do, do you know what your blossom is? Your blossom is what produces fruit. In other words, their life blasts in the field. Anyone that participates in any one of those six woes, they're never going to produce any fruit. Basically, until they really come to the law of Almighty God, that's to say His word, His advice, His counsel, but most of all, His blessings then you're in a heap of hurt, friend. Your blossom is going to go up as dust, meaning it, it just vanishes. And that's where the new fruit comes from. You know, that kills off a whole year's crop. Let's say if you get a heavy frost on the peach blossoms, they wilt and fall off and that's it. And it would seem that in human life, um, it's as bad as a frost hitting these six woes are when they fall on your life and you participate in any one of the six. It's not good. And to cap it off, the way you end up in one of those six woes or committing one of those six woes is you've left the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. That's what you've done. Verse 25, what, where does that get you? Verse 25, therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled, it's hot, against his people. And he hath stretched forth his hand against them and has smitten them. And the hills did tremble and their carcasses was torn in the midst of the streets. I, I'd rather translate that their bodies become dung in the street because that's what the word is in the Hebrew. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. In other words, he's going to correct. Why? Because he loves his children. Now, that anger is addressed to those that commit the six woes. It's not against those that love him. His anger and his arm is not stretched out against those that help him. His arm is not stretched out to those that listen to the very word of Almighty God, the Lord, the host of all Israel. Verse 26. And he will lift up an ensign to the nations. This word nations is goy. So it's certainly not the nation Israel, got it? From far, and will hiss unto them from the end of the earth, and behold, they shall come with, with speed swiftly. This is our enemy. I'm, I'm going to call them right down in on top of you. And uh, this is the army of the locust. You can read of it in the great book of Joel. It's when God's elect begin to witness and testify the sons and daughters both, as it is written in the minor prophet, great book of Joel in uh, chapter two. He whistles like you'd call a snake, hisses uh, rather. That's, that's the way a snake is called. What is he in Senegal? The snake people, okay? 27, none shall be weary for st uh, or stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep, your enemy, that is to say. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed. They're not going to take five. Nor the latchet of their shoes be broken. There's not going to be any lame ones along. That army, when it marches, it's coming. 
Again, you can read of that army in, in uh, Joel chapter 2, or you can read of it in um, the great book of Revelations in chapter 9, the locust army. Verse 28, whose arrows are sharp and all their bows bent, their horses' hooves shall be counted like flint and their wheels like a whirlwind, their chariots will, nothing can stop them. What is this talking about? Deception. That deception, when it begins to move upon the world, uh, the world is going to be hard put to stop it. Why? Because the majority of people will be taken in by the deception, the lies, the misleading. The very six woes that we just covered absolutely saturate the lives of a majority of people until it readies them and puts them in line, the, the, the six woes we just covered, for this deception. They're ready to grab at anything, any promise, and they let the prince of darkness become the prince of light, and that will destroy you. That's not good. Why? Basically because they leave off studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse and listen to the traditions of men that absolutely make void the Word of God and will allow you to fall into one of the categories of the six woes. God doesn't like it. Do not leave His Word out of the equation of your life. Verse 29, their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. They're going to rip and tear with deception. Yea, they shall roar and lay hold of the prey and shall carry it away safe and none shall deliver it. That should remind you again of Revelation chapter 9 where they, they look, have the voice of a, a tenderness like a, a woman. But they rip and tear like a lion with deception. That's what, that's the trademark of the locust army is to deceive and to carry away. Uh, the, when, when he says a young lion, he means they've got energy, they got vigor. Okay. They do it with a passion. Verse 30 to continue. And in that day, they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. Well, what day are we talking about? Just before the Lord's day. Like the roaring of the sea. And if one look unto the land, behold, darkness and sorrow. And the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. In other words, the smoke of the locust army that comes from the pit. The deception that comes upon the people. Do you, know, do you know what this one will be promising people when he arrives? It, you're told in the New Testament, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, he sits in Jerusalem, this place, claiming to be God, performing miracles in the sight, the very vision, the sight of the people of the world. And they're going to let the light of the Word of God turn into the darkness of the Prince of Darkness and rush to Him. God intends to let this come to pass. Not to those that believe the Word of God and know that they have a destiny and a purpose and that they will stand against this one. And as it is written in the great 13th chapter of Mark, they will know to allow the Holy Spirit without premeditation, put word, they, will, they will allow the Holy Spirit to speak through them so that the true testimony of the Word of God goes back to these six woe people that are deceived. And actually, uh, as we just covered the great book of Luke, which has chapter 21, which has the same subject, the same locust army, the same God's election defending against them, that um, their words that the Holy Spirit speaks through them converts even the gainsayers. And he promises in Luke 21 that not one hair of your head can be touched. Why? 
He tells Satan, you cannot touch those that have the seal of God in their forehead. What's in your forehead? Your brain. What's in your brain? The Word of God. If you study it chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you cannot be deceived. You escape the hour of temptation because you do not find Satan tempting. Avoid the six woes and stick with the Word of God. Be loved by Him rather than He being against you. It's that simple. Now we come to chapter 6, and we hear, here we have God's voice from the temple. It's a vision by Isaiah, and, and, and it is a vision of God wanting to talk to you. And his voice does come from that temple. Chapter 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. What, um, in other words, the earthly king died, and Almighty God, the true king, sit on the throne, took over. Ultimately, that's what happens. You understand? That's what the vision is about. We, man wanted a king so bad that he had to have a flesh king when God was our, wanted to be our king all the time. I hope he's your king today, king of kings and lord of lords. Verse 2, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. This, this is a sign of humility. And with twain he covered his feet. Again, that's humbleness. And with twain he did fly, meaning he was, um, he, he was celebrating the glory of the presence of Almighty God. Verse 3, And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. It is if you'll partake of it. It is if you'll stay in his word. You won't be like those six woes in the prior chapter. It's there for everyone, whomsoever will. Again, I remind you, this is a vision. Okay. Verse 4. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke, with a Shekinah glory present, uh, God's being present. Five. Then said I, woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, all six woes. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. I've seen the King, I've seen the Lord of lords, the King of kings, and I feel so unworthy that even the very cherubims themselves Stand in awe and in um, and humbly stand before him. And here I am in a flesh body with unclean lips, just not fit to even be here. That's what Isaiah is saying. It would give you that feeling, okay? Verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tong, the thongs from off the altar. I mean, the very altar of God. He brings this coal. Verse 7, And he laid it upon my mouth. Did it burn him? Of course not. And said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. You've escaped it. You're all right. God has purified your lips, whereby God was going to speak through this one Isaiah to bring us the Word of God. This one prophet that he would send to both Jerusalem and Judah, the house of Judah, as well as the house of Israel, but primarily to that geographical location that our Father loved so much. And he made this one worthy. Do you know something? That's, that's the Holy Spirit touching you today if you're called into His service. Some of you have a destiny and a purpose. You're a comfort to those around you. Why? Well, because you have the Word of God. It always comforts. It always fills. 
It doesn't empty. It takes care of, it builds up, not down. It brings light, not darkness, and gives hope instead of loss. How precious it is that he was touched by that one from the very altar of God. Verse eight, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Question. Then said I, here am I, send me. I, I don't know, have, have you ever volunteered to the Father to be at his service? For him to use you? Well, I, 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 don't, I feel inadequate. We all do, okay? We all are. But when his spirit touches you and gives you utterance and guidance and direction, then uh, you're a sent one. Do you know what a sent one is? That's what the apostles were, one sin of God. Well, he also needs helpers to see that the people are fed the word of God. Verse 9, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. In other words, some of them have, they don't have eyes to see, nor do they have ears to hear. This is that old parable, of the sowing of the seed. Some just don't get it. Verse 10, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Naturally, what this has reference to a sin committed in ignorance is no sin. But once you have eyes to see and to know that the false Messiah is coming first, there's no excuse for you to worship him after that. You're almost bordering on the unforgivable sin if you even consider the thoughts of following the false Christ. So therefore, some people, as it is written in the New Testament in Romans chapter 11, God sent the spirit of slumber upon them, this, that they couldn't see and they couldn't understand. Have you ever taken a person that is extremely intelligent in ways of the world and the street and bring forth the simplicity of what happened in the garden and they snuff at you? They can't see it, as simple as it is. Do you know why you can't share it with them? Because they're blinded. They've been closed off for their protection in a sense. That's why you must always allow God to grow the seed after you've sown it. Otherwise, it won't grow. So you have to leave that in God's hands. Um, because if they were to hear and understand, if you forced it upon them, then they're accountable. Verse 11, to continue. Then said I, Lord, how long? Question. And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without men, and the land be utterly desolate. This word desolate should be translated desolator comes because that's what it's talking about. Desolation caused by the desolator. Who is the desolator? The son of perdition. And again, I'll refer back again to the New Testament. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you're told exactly when. The same question, when, Lord? He says, don't worry, it won't, Christ will not return until after the son of perdition, this desolator, stands in Jerusalem claiming to be God, to deceive, if you would, the world. And you know what? Most of the world is going to harlotry, they're going to practice harlotry right after him. Why? Right? Because of the deception. Because they are deceived. Because they have failed in avoid, avoiding the six woes forementioned in this chapter that 
they become lost and blinded by not being familiar with the true Word of God, which is to say both Old and New Testament. And the letter that your Father has written to you, advising you whereby you have the wisdom and the knowledge to know and to understand and to rise above deception. Verse 12, and the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. Uh, the um, real Messiah is going to show up and they're going to forsake the real Messiah for the, uh, the bad. Okay. Why? Because of the woes. Each of those bad habits and all six of them together, the main fault being the leaving off of the Word of God. You did understand that, didn't you? That the main fault of all six woes and what God was most angry about is they had left off the law and the Word of Almighty God. And that will lead you to destruction. It will lead you into that that he has promised they'll make light dark and dark light. That prince of darkness is coming. It is written throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. If you've studied any of God's word, you know that that false one comes first. That's what he's telling us even in this chapter. But there's a beautiful message in the last verse of this chapter that you don't ever want to forget. Because out of all these problems and all this trouble, when God said, I'll send you after you're touched with the real spirit, after you know and after you understand, whereby I can utilize you, I can use you. But why? Because you're educated in the, in the word of God. You know and understand. You're fit for the chore. You're up to the task. You can perform for Almighty God because you know what God's plan is. You know, if you don't know God's plan, if you do not know what He intends, then you're sure not going to be much help. If, if you are employed in some business and you do not know what that business is, understand it, or are able to perform it, then you're probably not going to keep your job very long. Well, so it is with serving God or being sent. You need, to be, you need to be familiar with the plan of operation. You need to be familiar with what it is God would have you do. Chapter, uh, verse 13 to complete the chapter. But yet in it shall be a tenth, and it shall return. In other words, there's God's election in there. And shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them. An oak tree is always known for its strength, its stability. That that can be held on to, that that you can count on. When they cast their leaves, listen carefully, so the holy seed, I repeat, so the holy seed shall be the substance thereof. Well, what's this holy seed? Well, it's God's holy children. Those that have the word. I think it's important that you know what this word substance is. And then we'll reread that verse. The word substance is mestisbeth in, in the Hebrew tongue. And it means a monumental stone, stationary, meaning you can count on it. It's, it's a stone that stands for something. So let's go back and reread that. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed shall be the monument stone, the monumental stone that is stationary. In other words, they can't be switched around. And they are solid thereof, meaning with the word of God, to fulfill it, to carry out. And he knows it because they're touched 
with the fire of that altar. Our Father is a consuming fire and through the Holy Spirit, He touches them to direct as it is written in the simplicity of Mark 13. You will be delivered up before the synagogues of Satan. You will not premeditate what you will say beforehand, but you will speak that that is given you in that hour. What hour? The hour of temptation for most people. Not tempting to you. And even the gainsayers convinced by what you say at that time. What a time to live in this generation of the fig tree whereby all these things shall come to pass all these prophecies shall be fulfilled as Jesus promised in that same chapter I forementioned, Mark 13. When you see the generation of the fig tree which began in the year of our Lord, 1948, when Israel, this city, Jerusalem, in part, become a nation again. That, both the good and the bad fig, set there. And that started the generation of the fig tree and Jesus promised all prophecy would be fulfilled in that generation. You're in it. What a time to live and what a time for God to inform you about his word, his letter, his plan, his plan of bringing about the consummation of the end of this age. And that you're a monumental stone involved, solid, immovable, and stationary. That's fantastic that our Father picks a people, the holy seed, the seed that Jesus, his last words on the cross before he would say it is finished, as it is written in Psalms 22, the last verse, they're counted as a generation. That generation is the generation of the fig tree. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD 